one going to be ordinated, and he's not nervous at all. Not one bit. <laughs> so we're going to try to make this quick and painless for him. But, you know, before, before we get him up here and get him all red-faced and stuff, I just want to say a few words uh, about deacons and, and, you know, what that that really means to us. And, you know, the, the, the term, I guess not really the term, but the first first sign of, of deacons coming about in the Bible is in the book of Acts. And it's in Acts chapter 6. And uh, in Acts chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 7, basically what was going on is that you had, in the, the church was just starting. And in the church, you had basically uh, two sides to the church. You had the Greek side, which were uh, from the, the Greek city. And these were just Greek people who had accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Then over here on this side, you had the Jewish people who were formerly Jewish, but they had accepted Jesus Christ and became Christians. Well, uh, the Bible says that the, the Greek people over here, they, they call them uh, Hellenists because they were uh, from that part of the country. And they, so the, the Greek people over here thought that they were not getting treated right because uh, back then the church took care of everybody, and especially widows and orphans. They didn't have Medicaid and all that stuff. They had the church. And so if you had a, a widow or an orphan or you were poor didn't have no food, you went to the church. Well, the Greek people, they, they felt like they were getting mistreated. They said, you know, when, when our widows uh, come up there to get fed and to get help, they, they can't get no help because all the Jewish people are being taken care of. And we feel like it ain't fair. And so the, the boys who are the apostles... I call them the boys because, you know, they were the boys. Boys got together, good old redneck boys got together and said, you know, it ain't right that we should just quit Bible studying and preaching and praying and go out here and wait tables and serve these people. We got to do something about it. We need to get some people to take care of these daily needs so we can focus on spiritual needs. And, and uh, so that's what they did. They are. It says here, I'll read it to you. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the, the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration or the, the daily handing out of food and care items. And so then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And it says this saying pleased everybody, the whole multitude. And it says they chose Stephen. We all knew that, that was a good choice because when you read about Stephen... He is a really good man. So their first choice was a really good choice. And all of them were really. Uh, so Stephen and uh, a man, he says, Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost. And Philip, we know Philip was a good choice too. They say Philip uh, went out there and, and evangelized all the Ethiopians and stuff in that region. And had many and started a whole church over on that side that's still there today. Uh, and so he says, Philip and Procurus and the Cantor, and I don't know them two, but I'm sure they did great things. And uh, the Cantor and Timon and uh, Paranias and Nicholas, and, and uh, they set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Uh, and the word of God, as a result of this, the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So when they done this, it worked really good. And it brought even more people. And everybody was happy. So it was a good thing. Uh, and then it, you know, it talks about what type of person can be a deacon. And we've all talked about this as far as the, the deacons here and, and me and deacons at other churches and stuff. And, and when it comes right down to it, ain't none of us 
qualified to be a deacon. Well, preachers are nothing. The only thing that qualifies us is Jesus Christ. You know, he, he don't call the qualified, but he qualifies those who he calls. And I praise God for that. And, and no, none of us are worthy or, or effective on our own, but when we let the Holy Ghost have his way in our lives, we become equipped and affected by God. And, and it says here, the, the deacons, what kind of people should they be? Well, uh, you can find that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. And, and you know, this is not an exhaustive list of what deacons should be. And, I mean, it's a pretty good, pretty good uh, outline. You know, it says, likewise, deacons must be grave. Now, grave, that's a... Uh, you know, I guess that means uh, opposite of Charlie, because I like to play around, and, and I'm not real serious all the time. They say, Dick, you know, be serious, but not so serious that people can't talk to you serious, but you should be serious. Uh, you should be a serious person, not double tongue means a liar. Shouldn't be a liar. Shouldn't be given to much wine. I don't think that means much explaining, but I will explain it to you. Uh, given to much wine means that you shouldn't be a drunk if you're going to be a deacon. And it, it don't say no wine, you know, just saying, but it don't say, but it does say too much wine. Uh, not greedy of filthy lucre. Now, uh, greedy of filthy lucre, that means money hungry. And, and not only that, but it means that, you know, you'll get your money anyway. And everybody always confuses, they say, uh, the, that money is the root of all evil. But that ain't what the Bible says. Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. God ain't against wealthy people. God wants to make you wealthy, I believe. God loves his children, and he would love his children to be wealthy if he thinks they can handle it. Christy said that's why we poor, because God knows I couldn't handle money. I'd spend it all on guitars and boats and all that kind of stuff. So we're, I'm, I'm poor on account of that, according to Christy. <laughs> but... But God wants us all to be wealthy, but he don't want you to love your money or your possessions more than you love him. He don't want you to count on your money to get you out of trouble. He wants you to count on him to get you out of trouble. He don't want you to count on your assets and your 401k for your future. He wants you to rely on him for your future. And so it's nothing wrong with money. It's nothing wrong with wealth as long as you put God first. And I believe if you put God first, he's going to keep giving and keep giving so it overflows you and you can impact others for it. But you, you can't be greedy over it. It says you need to be a giving person, especially if you're going to be a deacon. And it says here, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. And, you know, that's pretty much just meaning when you're, I don't know about y'all, but everybody that knows me knows I don't have no trouble sleeping. Matter of fact, it's, you know, when I, when my butt hits the recliner, it's like it's a switch and it just closes my eyelids. <laughs> and, and so, but, you know, if, if I didn't have a clear conscience, it might be a little harder to sleep at night. And so that basically it's saying here, if you're going, if you're going to be a deacon, if you're going to do something extra special for God, your conscience needs to be clear. It might be some people here to this morning saying, well, that eliminates me. I couldn't be a deacon because I've got a guilty conscience. Well, relieve your conscience this morning. How do you do it? Just say, God, I confess. You know what I did. I confess. I'm guilty. Now, God, I wish you would forgive me for it. Cleanse me from my sins and help me to repent and walk in a different direction. And bam, your conscience is cleared. Because my God is the God of second chances. And he wants to give you a second chance this morning to have a clear conscience. To make that, that pillow a little softer at night so you can go to bed without, without worrying. A lot of people stay up but they can't sleep because they worry to death. And, and the reason you worry is because your conscience is just spinning around and around. Well, hey, say, God, Lord, I, I wish that you would heal me of this worrying that I do all the time. And, and I ain't talking about nobody that I know. I'm just talking about 
in general that we should just like say, Lord, please heal me of this worrying that I do in the name of Jesus. <laughs> that was that was pretty inconspicuous, right? That's right. <laughs> and she's not worrying. She's worried about why she's not worrying. I should be worrying about something. Where did all this peace like a river come up on me? I'm worried now because I've got peace in my life. But yes, that's what we all need because you know what? If you're worrying, what does that mean? If you're so busy worrying, it means you ain't trusting. Worry is the opposite of trust. Faith is the opposite of fear. If you're worried, that means you ain't trusting. You need to trust God more. So... Anyway, let's get back to deacons instead of just uh, my family. So, <laughs> and it says here, uh, and, and also let these first be proved. Now, you know, it, it means that you shouldn't just let a new Christian come in off the street that just accepted Jesus and turn him into a deacon. Well, for one thing, they don't have no experience about how church goes and, and how it operates. And, and they probably ain't never been to that thing we call a business meeting. And you need to at least survive some of them before you can be a deacon, uh, which, praise God, ours have been pretty good here recently. But, uh, you know, you, you got to, and plus you got to make sure they ain't going to get mad at the preacher and leave, but right after they become a deacon, because, you know, that can happen. But, uh you know, whatever it is, they need to have a little time to prove that they're going to stick around and they're going to serve God right now. And so it says, uh, also, uh, it says, that let them be proved. Then, uh, if they do good, then let them be uh, a deacon. And it says, even so must also their wives. Uh-oh. You didn't know you was going to get drugged into this, did you? <laughs> Even though their wives should be grave, ser which means serious, not slanderers. You know what slanderers are. They go around talking behind people's back about how bad they are. Sober, which, you know, there's that wine thing again. You can't be out there running the road getting drunk. Faithful in all things. And uh, let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Now, we could go on and on about that one again. Is it one wife uh, in the history of their lives? Is it one wife at the time? We ain't going there this morning. We're just going to say one wife is what it says. We'll fight that battle some other time when we got more time. Uh, and one wife uh, ruling their children in their own house as well. Well, that would, you know, that ruling their children thing could probably disqualify me from time to time because we know how our children are. Which I got good ones. They're, that one up there is turning red in the face. But I've been blessed. But. So we could, we could easily see here how anybody could fail easily at any of these things and, and uh, according to the word be disqualified. But like I told you before, just because you failed at one thing don't make you a failure unless you quit trying. And so it's with God's strength that we're able to do what God calls us to do. And so I believe with all my heart, David is qualified to be a deacon. And I believe his wife is qualified to be the wife of a deacon. And, uh, and I got all the faith in the world in him. And at this point, I'm going to ask David to, to come on up here. <laughs>
church and the Bible being inerrant, infallible, and fully inspired by God. Will you accept the office of deacon in this church and promise faithfully to perform the duties required in this office? All right. Will you promise to cooperate with the pastor and to further the interest of this church in promoting its harmonious and effective working of all its ministries? All right. Well, at this time, I'm going to ask the congregation to stay. Because I got some questions for y'all, too. Will y'all, the members of the church, acknowledge and affirm this brother as a deacon? If you will, say amen. amen. Will you esteem him, encourage him, and cooperate with him as he performs the duties of a deacon? Amen. amen. All right. Y'all can be seated. And so, David, I now charge you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit that you ever strive to fill your office to the best of your knowledge and ability, and that you seek divine guidance uh, in all of your work by daily prayer and by and At this time, I'm going to ask all, all deacons uh, who've been ordained to, to come forward. I'm going to ask David if he would bow down, and we're going to lay our hands upon him. And when all the deacons, whether you're active or inactive, if, if you're visiting and you're a deacon, come on up here. Uh, we want everybody to be a part of this.
body of Jesus Christ. And the, the wine or juice represents his blood, which was spilled for us. The Bible also says that you shouldn't partake of this Lord's Supper uh, unless, unless your heart is right. And so the question is, how do I get my heart right so I'll be worthy or, or uh, acceptable to partake in this community? Well, the, the only thing that, there's two things that will make you unworthy of partaking in the Lord's Supper or communion. Number one would be that you were not saved. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I just want to tell you it's as simple as ABC to get saved. All you have to do is admit that Jesus Christ uh, died on the cross. He's able to save. You, you be is from believe. You believe that he's done that. And you believe that he is well able to save you if you call upon him. And the C is confess. Say, Lord, I'm yours. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I confess now that you are my Savior. And if you do that, you're worthy of it. The other way that you would be unworthy to partake of this Lord's Supper, according to the Bible, is if you had some type of unforgiving sin that you had in your heart. Sometimes people carry around anger or unforgiveness or, or whatever it is. And especially the unforgiveness thing, I've heard a lot of people say, well, I want to forgive them, but I just can't forgive them. Well, I want to tell you, anger and forgiveness and all that is a lot like love. You know, love is a choice. It ain't a feeling. You choose to love somebody. It's not how your heart feels because there's times uh, I'm sure that Christy don't feel like loving me and I don't feel very lovable. But you know what? She has made the choice to love me whether she feels lovey-dovey inside or not. I praise God for that. And you know, God has made the choice to love you whether or not you make him feel lovey-dovey. Because you know, sometimes I'm sure we make God downright mad. But um, so if you if you have anger or unforgiveness or something like that, it ain't about how you feel. It's about saying, I choose to lay it down. I choose to give it over to you, God. I choose to lay down my anger, my unforgiveness. And maybe you've got some kind of sin that you can't shake. Lord, I, I lay it down to you. Uh, or, or maybe you don't, you're not sure. You just say, Lord, I just wish, just like King David, he said, Lord, search my heart and try my ways. And if there be any iniquity found in me, show it to me. And then uh, I want to ask you to forgive me for that. And you can be sure if you do that, you'll be ready to take this Lord's Supper. So what, what I want to do is, is take a, a little bit of time here. And in silence, I want each of us to ask God to do that, to search our hearts and, and try our ways. And if there's something that we're doing or something in our lives that's not pleasing to him, I pray that he would show it to us. And, and if he shows you that, even if it's something that's more powerful than you, something that you've never been able to do before, don't worry about that. Just say, Lord, I surrender it to you. And, and I know I'm not able, but I know you are able. And if you'll do that, you will be worthy to partake of this supper. So let's go to the Lord's prayer. So Lord, again, we just ask that you would search our hearts, try our ways. If there's any, anything in our lives that is coming between us and you, I pray that you would show it to us right now. And if we see it, I just pray that we could ask you, Lord, 